Everyone good? Okay, thank you for coming along here to uh, Oz Harvest, a fantastic national uh, food recovery organisation who do great work. And can I thank uh, Bernardo Tobias, who will have more to say about the great work that this organisation does with its many partners, as indeed will Minister Carbines. Uh, but before that, could I firstly apologise for the lack of a Auslan interpreter. Uh, there were some logistical issues there, and um, uh, we'll certainly make sure that they don't continue to occur. Um, but the order will be I'll just do some of the COVID updates, then I'll ask Minister Carbines and Bernardo to talk about the important work and support for the food recovery efforts. And um, we'll see how we go. Okay, so um, in regards to the day uh, update on the coronavirus situation in Victoria, when it comes to vaccinations, some 35.7% of Victorians aged 18 and over have now been uh, third dosed, and we thank those very strong numbers of people coming forward. Uh, that's 1.88 million Victorians in that group. And we very strong numbers. We thank them for coming forward uh, in such strong numbers. But of course, there's still a long way to go when it comes to uh, that third dose crew uh, getting as many arms jabbed as we possibly can. In regards to yesterday, there were 17,776 Victorians third jabbed. Uh, across the state sites, and that brings to a total of the third doses through our Victorian state sites to 23,252 at those uh, state sites all up yesterday, understanding that many, many more Victorians continue to get those third dose and vaccine uh, for the paediatrics at our uh, partners in GPs and pharmacies and community health organisations, and we thank them for that outstanding effort. In regards to the paediatric vaccines, 4,861 children between the ages of 5 and 11 were vaccinated through our state-run clinics, bringing to over 216,000 uh, kids now in that age group, pushing on to about 38% of that group now getting their first vaccination. Uh, and they are great numbers, however, there's always more to do. And in that regards, we've currently got 12,981 children booked in to receive their first dose through state-run clinics over the next week. And we have some 82,000 plus appointments for that same age group over the next 30 days. So it is really important that families, carers and those who support those 5 to 11 year olds take the opportunity, whether it's either through GPs, pharmacies or state-run clinics, to come forward and get those vaccinations done. Uh, as a part of that, as we announced earlier in the week, there will be a series of uh, walk-up blitzes starting this weekend at the 15 pop-up clinics uh, targeting the school communities where we know uh, we need to do more to increase the numbers of vaccinations for those families in those communities that are disproportionately underrepresented when it comes to GP and pharmacy supports. Uh, having said that, the GPs and pharmacies right across the state are doing an extraordinary job so whether it's a state-run clinic, a GP, a pharmacy, a pop-up, please come forward and get those kids in the 5 to 11-year-old age group to get that important paediatric vaccination. As part of those uh, pop-ups for 5 to 11-year-olds, in addition to the 15 uh, school pop-ups, the following sites this weekend will be available for walk-up vaccinations for that group. They are the Sandown Racecourse, the Dandenong Plaza Vaccination Centre, the Caroline Springs Leisure Centre, the uh, Camberfield Ford 
factory complex, which is dealing uh, massive numbers of its vaccination clinic, uh, the St Albans Hospital for Out and Sunshine for Western Health, and the Knowlton Vaccination Hub. In regards to the third dose uh, arrangements more broadly for the 18 and above group, uh, more than 66,000 people are currently booked in to receive that third dose uh, over the next week. But again, there are some 220,000 appointments available in the system for the many, many hundreds of thousands indeed uh, as a result of bringing forward the time frame for that third dose to three months, the now more than two million Victorians who remain eligible for that third dose vaccination. Please, again, there are multiple opportunities in the state loan clinics, in the GP and pharmacy primary care provisions to get that really important dose. Uh, as we've seen in the data released over recent days, it is so important to protect you, uh, to protect your family, and to keep you out of hospital, and so protect our healthcare system. In regards to the figures in our healthcare system currently, we have seen uh, over the last 24 hours 988 Victorians in hospital with COVID-19, a slight decrease from the 1,057 figure yesterday. Uh, there are some 114 of those people are in intensive care and 40 of those are on a ventilator. Uh, tragically, 39 people with COVID-19 uh, passed away in the most recent reporting period. Our thoughts, of course, are with those 39 families, uh, those 39 groups of friends. Um, this is a significant loss at any time, but uh, in the context of the global pandemic, uh, our thoughts, our prayers and our best wishes go to those people who are grieving. In regards to the case numbers and how they were reported, some 7,410 people self-reported their positive status through the rapid antigen test program via the online portal and a further 5,345 Victorians received a positive PCR result yesterday. And that was from the 24,467 uh, PCR tests delivered. Um, this brings our current total of new cases for yesterday to 12,755 and a total active caseload of coronavirus in the Victorian community um, officially at 101,605 Victorians. Uh, so my message is like it always is, uh, the way out of this uh, global pandemic uh, and the Omicron variant that seems to have stabilised, the way in which Victorians can assist uh, our healthcare system uh, and the way in which Victorians can continue uh, the efforts towards uh, recovery, staying open, is to do your bit when it comes to being vaccinated. Please, whether you're a family or a carer of young people in that 5 to 11 category, come forward and get that important vaccination, get our kids back to school, get them vaccinated and get our families and the industries that those families work in secure through that process. And if you're in the 18 and above group, if you're one of the several million Victorians now eligible, please come forward for exactly the same reason. There's plenty of opportunities there to get vaccinated. It's really critical. And in those other groups, whether it be the 16 and 17 year olds now endorsed by the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, to now become available for the third booster dose as soon as we get the approval uh, through AHPPC and ATAGI for that. We'll have more to say about that group. But the important message is vaccinations work. Vaccinations keep us safe. They keep the 
pressure off our health system uh, and I'd encourage every Victorian to come forward and get vaccinated if you're eligible and able to do so. I'll ask Minister Carbines to come forward now uh, together uh, with Bernardo Tobias and talk about the great work that uh, organisations such as Oz Harvest do uh, in the face of really growing significant demand for food security for Victorians. So I'll pass over to Mr Carbines. Thanks very much, Mr Foley, and good morning, everyone. What a great announcement for Victorians today. From uh, Ballarat to Bansdale, Melbourne to Mildura, we're making sure that vulnerable people get the food and the meals that they need when they need them, because no Victorian should be going hungry during this pandemic. Really pleased that Bernardo Tobias, who's the state manager in Victoria and South Australia for Oz Harvest, is joining us today and hosting us this morning. And we'll hear more from him on the great work Oz Harvest are doing shortly. And in particular, to put into context, Oz Harvest these past two years have delivered something like almost 10 million meals to vulnerable Victorians who need it most through the pandemic. It's a fantastic effort, an inspiring effort. It's something like 4 million kilograms of food that otherwise may have gone to waste that's finding its way to the kitchen tables of Victorians who need it most in this pandemic. And I wanted to thank Bernardo and his team for the work that they've done these past two years in particular to support vulnerable Victorians in need. It's part of, of course, a $39 million fund over the past two years from the Andrews government, our Emergency Food Relief Fund, and I'm pleased today that, uh, to announce we're drawing down a further $1.67 million from that $39 million food relief fund to continue to support the work of OzHarvest, about 12 other key partners that provide and coordinate our food relief services across the state. It's an opportunity for me also to thank staff at the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing, as well as our hundreds of charitable partners, our volunteers right across the state, neighbourhood houses, community health, local government and many others, who work with organisations like Oz Harvest and our other key critical food relief partners to ensure that food relief gets from organisations like Oz Harvest to the communities and the homes and families that need it most. I also want to thank Oz Harvest for the work that they're doing on our Food Relief Task Force established by the Andrews government, which is making sure that we're coordinating effective and efficient food relief services across the state and, as we come out of the pandemic, making sure that into the future we have coordinated, long-term, robust emergency food relief services. Uh, and the engagement and support that we get from Oz Harvest has been critical to ensuring we have those long-term services in place through the Food Relief Task Force. Again, uh, that $1.67 million that we're announcing today that's drawn down from our $39 million emergency relief food fund uh, will go a long way to continuing the great work organisations like Oz Harvest are doing to get critical food services on the tables of those who need it most in the pandemic, because no Victorian should go hungry during this pandemic. I'd like to welcome Bernardo to say a few words further about the great work Oz Harvest are doing on the ground to support vulnerable Victorians. Thanks, Bernardo. Thank you, Minister, and thanks everybody for coming in here today. So, um, yeah, very grateful for the opportunity to highlight the work that we have done in the in the past two years, but also the importance of us all working together with government and all sectors of community, not only to respond to the crisis, but also moving beyond and uh, making sure that we come out on the other side a uh, more resilient community, making sure that no one gets left behind. Um, Oz Harvest is a leading for impact organisation, basically making sure that no good food goes to waste and that it um, basically it's made available for people in need out there in the community. We work with a network of about 1,800 charitable organisations across the country. Uh, about 200 of them are here in Victoria. And uh, we work with a large network of about 4,000 food businesses across, across the country as well, making sure that they have an avenue to divert uh, any food that is no longer sellable 
to people in need. Um, so we are very proud of the work that we've uh, that we've always done. But of course, like in any any other sector of the of society, uh, the pandemic has thrown uh, curveballs that we had to adapt and we had to sh change the way that we did things. We couldn't have done it without the support from government. It was the first time that we relied on government for for assistance and. Um, the level of coordination and support just meant that we were able to deliver 10 million meals in the past couple of years to the community in Victoria in this time of need. To put that into perspective, we've been operating in Victoria since 2013, and uh, we moved 10 million meals between 2013 and 2019. Between 2020 and 2021, we've doubled that. That highlights the 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 pressures that we were under, but we must recognise the agencies that we work with, the front line out there actually opening their doors, rain or shine, outbreak or not, to the vulnerable community of Victoria to make sure that they had food on their tables and make sure that they could feed their families. Uh, food is a lot more than just food. It is dignity. And we have seen as a result of the pandemic about 30 per cent of, of people that had to access food relief never had to do that before. It was the first time that these people had to access food relief. We had people that lost people who lost their jobs, people who for, for different circumstances found themselves in that situation where they were skipping meals or they weren't able to put food on the table at all. And uh, you can only imagine the stigma that that carries um, and uh, that, that feeling that when you can't feed your family or, or you can't feed yourselves, it is a terrible situation that we don't wish on anyone. And, uh, but thanks to, to the support that we have received and thanks to the level of coordination that we have seen um, since, the, since the task force started, we managed to get that food out and we managed to get a lot more food out. Whilst Harvest, for the first time, we, 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 we had to purchase food. We saw severe fluctuations on food rescue uh, due to panic buying and most recently the supply chain challenges uh, that severely affected our, our food rescue levels. And uh, we had to purchase food. The only way we could afford it was thanks to the funding that was provided from the Department of Families and from the Andrews government throughout the, throughout the pandemic. We purchased the food with two things in mind. We wanted to purchase the food locally from local producers, uh, local businesses, especially in regional areas that we managed to connect with the local organizations in those regional areas, making sure that food was, uh, that, that food was distributed locally, making sure that we were establishing those connections and making sure that those connections hopefully remain in the future once the pandemic is, uh, is just part of history. But uh, also the second focus was in nutrition. We must recognise that food insecurity is a public health crisis, a public health crisis that has been here for a very long time and unfortunately will continue to be here for a long time to come. And um, we must recognise as a, as a public health crisis, we must recognise that we in the sector have a responsibility to make sure that the food that we are uh, putting out there is of high nutritional level and, uh, and healthy, culturally appropriate, and making sure that it is uh, made available with no questions or barriers. We make sure we do that by working very closely with the network of, of agencies that we work with. We couldn't do what we do without them. And um, they have seen challenges throughout the, throughout the couple of years that we've seen as well in terms of volunteering numbers and staffing numbers. But they remained strong, they remained open, and they remain uh, making sure that we, that we could reach out to, to the communities in every corner of the state. Once again, we thank the government for the commitment in this space, um, for the ongoing commitment in this space, 
We are looking forward to continuing to work with the government, with governments of all levels, with industry. It needs all sectors of society working together if we are to address these issues. And uh, we are hopeful that we can address them. We produce enough food to feed everybody, so no one should be going hungry. It is a basic human right that uh, people have access to affordable, healthy, so, uh, culturally appropriate food in every, every corner of the country. We're here to nourish our country and we'll do everything we can to, to get there. But we can't do without the support. So thank you, ministers. And uh, thanks to everybody that was involved, including the department, um, everybody that has been involved. It's been absolutely critical for us but most importantly, absolutely critical to the community in Victoria, and we, we thank you all. We're happy to take questions. Thanks, Bernardo. Thanks very much, and in particular, um, for coming back, I know, from leave to join us today and is particularly, I think, a, a, an example of your passion and involvement for Oz Harvest and to ensure vulnerable Victorians understand the, the critical work that you're doing, the services available to them. Perhaps if uh, there's any questions in relation to our announcement on food relief services today, then I can uh, hand over to Minister Foley on, on other matters. Uh, I'm going to be in regards to helping uh, this, this sector out. The government looking at helping other sectors out is still struggling the uh, hospitality and reach out to people hospitality, given that they're staying home. Certainly there's a range of uh, my colleagues in their conversations and engagement to build on many of the programs and grant arrangements that we've had in place to support other industries and businesses at this time where many people of course are taking appropriate precautions and, and either staying home or limiting their movement in the community during the pandemic. And what's also important is a responsibility that I have as Minister for, uh, for Family Services is to make sure that those vulnerable communities in particular are getting the services they need and the supports that they need to stay safe and to be supported at this time. And that's what's so critical about the work that Oz Harvest are doing for us today. Well, Dylan Olcott, of course, is not only an inspiration to all Australians, but certainly uh, for people with disability. Uh, he's going to be, I think, over the next year, as the Australian of the Year, a huge advocate. And we've had engagement and involvement as a government with Dylan Olcott in relation to uh, speaking to and, and promoting the work of volunteers and asking more of our community to engage people with disability either as volunteers but also pathways to employment and other opportunities in our community. And Dylan touched on the fact that we need to ask ourselves, uh, people with disability can do more than we think if they're given the opportunity. And I'm pleased that the Victorian State Disability Plan, our new disability plan for the coming years is imminent in terms of its announcement and it will reflect, I'm sure, a lot of the priorities that Dylan has talked about, about employment and respect and opportunities for people with disability. There's lots of challenges that we've found also through the pandemic where people, of course, have had to isolate uh, or people have had uh, to withdraw some of their involvement in the community or they know people who are unwell uh, and who are unable to, of course, uh, access the food services that they need. And so what we've sought to do through either encouraging people to contact their local government, uh, you can put them in touch with food relief services on the ground, but there are always people in the community who are going to need our support, advocacy and assistance. And in particular, we know the pandemic has hit hardest vulnerable communities. And in any community, there will be those who need extra support and commitments from government. And what we're announcing here is a further investment in the food relief services. And when you talk about Oz Harvest delivering some 10 million meals in the past two years, it's an indication of the effort that the government and our charitable partners are putting in to ensure that those hit hardest in this pandemic are getting every support.
Absolutely. Mr. Foley. Thank you. Well, we support the Otagi position, as indeed do all uh, states and territories, as, as well as I understand it. So the position that Otagi arrived at earlier this week was to bring forward their advice that should you have um, uh, had COVID-19, that the previous position of waiting up to six weeks should be brought forward to a, a maximum of four weeks, but that's underpinned by the proposition that uh, if you do have and recovered fully from COVID, that you should get your third booster dose, or indeed, uh, if you're in the uh, younger age groups, when you are eligible for that next vaccine, you should get that uh, when you don't show uh, symptoms. So I'm sure that all states and territories are up for that. Uh, how that gets communicated is, of course, up to each state. So New South Wales telling their citizens, is that what was discussed with the Well, as I understand the Otagi position, which was updated as recently as Tuesday, uh, perhaps it just takes a bit of time for that update to get through the communications machines but all the states and territories, and particularly Victoria and New South Wales, are acting very closely on this important issue. Now with you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians having had and recovered from COVID, it is so important that when you don't uh, have any further symptoms, and if you are eligible for a vaccine, please come forward and get that. It will give you a higher level of immunity and protection keep you safe, keep you safe uh, going into when we do come out of summer, uh, who knows where we'll be with further variants, but more importantly, you will be doing your bit to keep the wider community safe and to keep the pressure off our health system. So we're in the high 30 per cent. Uh, that's a strong number. But of course, uh, with, as I understand it, uh, over half a million uh, young Victorians in that age bracket, we've still got a way to go, which is why we're very strong in encouraging families through the pop-ups and the walk-ups that I announced earlier uh, and the further measures that we've put in place. An important part of that is to both encourage families and carers to come forward and have those kids in the five to 11 year old age bracket vaccinated to make that as easy as possible, um, not just through state clinics, but through uh, GPs and pharmacies, pop-ups, community-based activities, whether it be at uh, the zoo, uh, the museums and other locations where we know families and kids will hang out, but then equally to make sure that those people, those adults who are around those sectors are also vaccinated which is why we now have in place the requirement that those uh, adults in that group need to get vaccinated to both protect them and to protect uh, the young people in their care. Oh, well, we want to see everyone that is eligible to come forward. We want to see, I think the figure is some 580,000 plus young people in that age group we want to see every one of those who are eligible to get vaccinated. That's our target. Uh, that's how we're going to drive down um, uh, the Omicron variant. That's how we're going to be best positioned for whatever next curveball that the uh, global pandemic pitches at us. And that's how we're going to keep our schools open and safe. And that's how we're going to keep the pressure off our health system. Uh, so uh, I understand over 2 million uh, rapid antigen tests have made their way 
uh, from a day or so ago to our schools with 4 million, 4.6 I think, million uh, on their way to schools as we speak. So six plus million rapid antigen tests will be at uh, both state, Catholic and independent schools. How each of those schools, and we're talking like thousands of schools, how those schools get those out to their communities and their families, uh, they are matters that those communities are best placed to deal with. And we're confident that uh, that system will be in place and up and running for the school year. That will be an important part of giving families, uh, giving the education workforce and giving the wider community confidence that schools, once they open, will stay open. We are, of course, expecting, with more than a million kids coming back to school and the movement that's associated with that, we are, of course, expecting, with that increased movement, an uptick in cases. But we think we are in a position to respond quickly to that. Uh, and the importance of rapid antigen tests as part of the mitigation strategy of that are really, really significant. And I'd encourage all families, and of course, I don't need to encourage schools because they're out there doing it, to uh, cooperate to make sure that we've got that system in place uh, as soon as the school year starts next week. Uh, because those school peak bodies tell us that. We are working very closely with the Catholic Education Office and Independent Schools Victoria and the Department of Education to make sure that the commitment that we had, which was that these uh, almost 7 million rapid antigen tests would be at schools next week uh, and that would be in the hands of families next week and we are confident that that will be the case uh, and I am a very firm believer that that will empower those school communities, those families to take the steps in partnership with their schools, in partnership with the health system to uh, ensure that in the uh, likelihood that there is some level of outbreak at schools that they can respond quickly and they can respond uh, in a timely way that allows those families and those school communities to do the right thing look after those people who may, those kids who may contract coronavirus, but at the same time, keep schools open and keep schools safe. Uh, well, we indicated that the rapid antigen test would be available next week, and we're confident that they will be available next week. Having said that, over two million are in the hands of schools today. So we regret, uh, as, do, as indeed do all states and territories, the need to postpone um, non-category one elective surgery uh, in the face of unprecedented demand that our healthcare system is under. Uh, right across the country, including here in Victoria, we've seen really important um, uh, surgeries delayed, uh, and we are constantly working with both the private and the public sector uh, hospitals as to when it will be safe to look at how we can turn back on uh, elective surgery. We're working with Safe Care Victoria, we're working with the health networks, we're working with the private uh, hospitals, we're working with the various colleges of physicians, of emergency management, of emergency medicine uh, and surgeons, as well as the AMA and others, as to what is the appropriate time frame to turn back on uh, that elective surgery in what order, understanding that the only reason we've done it is uh, to delay non-category one surgery is to protect the wider health system in the face of unprecedented demand under what has always been the enduring principle in approaching this issue that those with the greatest and most immediate health care need get the greatest and most immediate attention 
and that is that is Victorians with COVID-19. We've seen almost 40 people pass away in the most reporting most uh, uh, recent reporting issue uh, period. This is a really significant challenge for our healthcare system, our, our hospitals, our GPs, our pharmacists are all under pressure like never before. When it's safe to do so, uh, we will turn the system back on. Uh, so every day we meet and discuss this issue. Every day those conversations are underway. Uh, at the moment, we don't have anything to adv uh, uh, no advice as yet as to when the most appropriate time to turn that system back on. But as we've seen throughout the course of the last two years, the minute that we get that advice, uh, the minute that we're able to turn back on safely and in a measured way those services, then that's what we'll do. Uh, so Mr West is, I'm sure, welcome to uh, come to Australia under an appropriate visa like any other um, global figure uh, subject to the terms of those visas. Uh, uh, as we all well and truly know, visas are a matter for the Commonwealth. Uh, I don't, frankly, um, know Mr West's vaccination status. Uh, I'm, reliably, I'm, I'm li reliably informed that it has been the subject of some community discussion, uh, but I am advised as recently as this morning uh, that apparently Mr West claims to be vaccinated. Now, Mr. Ben, in terms of health, this is an ongoing discussion I remember even in the 80s. The AMA and nurses unions, public service unions have always been very sceptical about overseas doctors and overseas professionals. They should be granted skills and acceptance of their qualifications here. Is it time to loosen up a bit? Partly, I'm quite shocked that I know it's well, I don't necessarily support the basis of your assertion that uh, Victoria's professional health bodies are somehow or another anti-global um, uh, professionals coming into the Victorian system. Uh, I would, uh, from my personal experience, just point out that whether it's nurses, doctors, surgeons, uh, allied health professionals, they are strong supporters of um, global, appropriately qualified people coming into Victoria. The real issue is making sure that those standards are comparable and achievable. And um, the Victorian health system, indeed the Australian health system, for many, many years, particularly in regional Victoria and regional Australia, is hugely dependent on those uh, international arrivals. And part of the reason that we've seen uh, some challenges right across our healthcare system, right across the country, is because that tap has been turned off over the last few years, which is why we have had good support from the Commonwealth, good support from the medical professions uh, and their professional bodies to fast track the return of appropriately qualified international uh, medical professionals into Victoria. They are forming a key part of our COVID response and I'm sure they'll continue to form a key part of our health workforce for many years to come. I'm always optimistic. Uh, it comes with the job. Uh, what I'm not prepared to call is just what will be the direction of this global pandemic. It's continued delivery of the unexpected uh, and curveballs is something that all of us have um, come to learn to appreciate. What I am hopeful is that the worst of the pandemic is behind us and that now with the strong community support for such high levels of vaccination, for being open, for keep getting our schools back, uh, for doing what we all can to keep the pressure off our public health system, off our GPs, off our pharmacies, is the most important thing we can do. And we can do that 
by coming forward and getting vaccinated and following the fairly mild public health uh, restrictions that are in place at the moment. Minister, is the government looking at uh, the possibility of increasing crab capacity for the Australian Open finals this weekend? Uh, well, I think um, Tennis Australia made some announcements uh, the other day uh, that Minister Bakula um, kicked off via his Twitter account, and uh, that's at a 65 per cent overall site capacity, understanding, of course, that that was in the context of all existing tickets being honoured. Uh, when, when it comes to, as I understand it, Rod Laver Arena, particularly for things like the women's final, that those figures of sold tickets are, the last I heard, above that. And of course, uh, we have seen some people make the decision to not uh, come and attend for perfectly understandable reasons in the course of the current outbreak, but uh, I'm looking forward to a safe and well-attended uh, last weekend of the Australian Open, which has been a fantastic event uh, for both Tennis Australia and Melbourne. Um, whether it's at the health minister level, the treasurer, uh, the business support ministers or indeed the premiers level, Victoria and New South Wales have had and continue to have a very close uh, alignment of our efforts as to how to respond to the uh, global pandemic in all of its iterations uh, in regards to any business support. Uh, I'm not aware of any programs being landed across government yet. Uh, if that happens, I'm sure the relevant ministers will have more to say at the appropriate time. Last question. Uh, because the COVID safe plans for particular venues are all judged on the circumstances at hand. Uh, a broad brush, uh, one is directly comparable with the other uh, approach, doesn't wash in a global pandemic. Uh, the circumstances of each venue are taken into account between the venue operator, the, uh, the public health team and our events team. And those COVID safe plans are fit for purpose and fit for venue. That's how I can justify it. No, QR codes are not redundant. There are equally other leading epidemiologists who say it is very necessary and that the infrastructure is needed for things like appropriate management of the very venues that you've just highlighted. Uh, safe and vulnerable settings, some of which our friends from Oz Harvest deal with every day, hospitals, disability settings, aged care, major events and a range of others. QR code systems form an important part of the public health infrastructure that allows us to stay open. Of course the test, trace and isolate and quarantine system is very different now than what it was to even a few months ago, let alone a few years ago. QR code systems continue to be well supported by Victorians uh, and as the test, trace, isolate and quarantine system continues to evolve, so too do the role in which QR codes play. Having said that, the very venues that I've just highlighted all point to the important role that QR codes play. All good? Thanks, Thanks for everyone.